Market to Market is everywhere you are. Subscribe to Market to Market on YouTube, find us on the PBS video app to stream on demand, and add our three podcasts on your favorite podcasting app. Just a generation ago, it would have been hard to imagine someone saying this. We have been uh, quite successful uh, at reducing and almost eliminating outright famine uh, from the world. Ken Menkhouse, a political science professor at North Carolina's Davidson College, isn't the only one who has noted how close the world has come to wiping out famine. Historically, they were recurrent, so famines have disappeared. That's excellent news. The one exception noted by these professors and the United Nations, which helps determine when a hunger crisis is officially declared a famine, is the situation in the African nation of Somalia just over a decade ago. I think in the 70s and 80s and into the 1990s, uh, famine was tragically very much a part of the, the political landscape uh, in a variety of places, especially in Africa. It would have surprised people to hear me say uh, just 20, 30 years later uh, that, that, that we thought we had conquered famine. And that's why the famine in Somalia in 2011, which, which claimed over a quarter of a million lives, uh, was such a setback and so stunning for us. It was a reminder that we haven't, in fact, solved all the underlying problems. The world has, however, dramatically reduced famine-related deaths most of which result from weakened immune systems combined with normally minor illnesses rather than directly from starvation. Since the 1860s, the Americas have represented a small portion of such deaths. The same is true of the Middle East. Historically, Asia, India and China in particular, struggled for generations with severe and recurring famines, a situation that eased with agriculture's green revolution which provided the region with better plant genetics in the 1970s. Parts of Europe suffered famine during the early to mid-1900s, including a World War II cluster of hunger-related deaths. Since the 1990s, Africa remains the only region still struggling with famine, though on a smaller scale than was typically seen in the past. Many of the historic famines were tied to either war or natural disaster, such as crippling drought. But with improved transportation and logistics for the movement of food and advances in agricultural production, experts say today's natural disasters are less likely to result in widespread death. You can now move efficiently place uh, supplies from places which have surpluses to places which have shortages in a very rapid fashion. And that's the reason of many famine in human history in the past. It was not because the food supply was not there. It means it could not be moved. More responsive government is key. Uh, that that uh, Amartya Sen, a famous Indian writer on this topic, uh, made a claim that was backed by strong evidence that democracies don't experience famine because democratic governments have to respond to the needs of their people. But there's also a number of other factors. The Green Revolution has dramatically increased production. Uh, we've got much better uh, food aid distribution systems. We've got high-tech and low-tech abilities to monitor uh, crops and yields long before we get to a loud humanitarian crisis. Both professors say the work done so far to feed the world during the COVID-19 pandemic has been a remarkable example of the resiliency of the world's food system. The, the pandemic was a gigantic stress test on our food supply systems in the United States in particular. It took some few weeks and months, to be a, a lot of headaches to adapt to it, but there was no technically shortages. And I remember going to the store at one point and they had no blueberries. And for a second, I was a little kind of put off by that. And then I realized, well, dude, we're living in a pandemic. You know, I mean, maybe there aren't supposed to be blueberries here now. One potential consequence of the pandemic on future famines, however, is the financial pressure that may follow the U.S. government's accumulation of an unusually large amount of COVID-related debt in the last two years. Foreign aid, however, is typically only a small percentage of the federal budget, about 1% most years. It could affect down the road the level of U.S. foreign aid that is manifested in 
actual money uh, that's allocated to uh, development assistance. I don't think it's going to affect humanitarian assistance in part because we are we continue to be a major producer of surplus food and we want to find constructive ways to use that. Menkaus is more concerned about the most significant remaining barrier to fully eradicating famine. We'll never see famine eradicated as long as food can be used as a political weapon. And that unfortunately is what's happening right now in uh, the Tigray region of Ethiopia, northern Ethiopia. Um, there is a war and an, a military operation going on um, in which food aid is being blocked. And we're now hearing that we are just a few short steps away from the possibility of seeing outright famine there again. Menkaus, who witnessed hunger and starvation while living in Somalia during an earlier famine, says it's important to remember food insecurity will continue to be a major concern, even if the world keeps the wolves at bay by holding off future famines that has a searing effect on you. When you see babies that malnourished, um, I got back to the United States and my first trip to the local grocery store just to pick up groceries and set up normal life, I got to the produce section and I just started crying. I just, I just lost it. It was the only time I had to wait until I got all the way back to the U.S. to see that level of plenty to realize and process what I had just seen in the famine. It just strikes you what a miracle our food system is. For Market to Market, I'm Colleen Bradford-Krantz.